awesome to see so many of you here. I, I, whilst I was doing the worship, during the worship, I just sense that. I really get a sense that God is gonna, God is stirring something up. Yes. And um, and as we're praying for revival and we're praying for a move of God, that it's not gonna come how we expect it to come. Do you get what I'm saying? It's yeah. like it's not gonna be like drip, 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 how we expect it. And when God's wave starts moving, it's gonna it's gonna disrupt our life. It's going to disrupt our program. Yeah. It's going to disrupt how we do things. Yeah. Amen. Because yeah. God's, it's not going to be drip, 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 drip. It's going to be like a storm. Yeah. God's going to move in a mighty way. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I really sense that we're going to see God move in a, hey, just, just lift your voice and begin to cry out, God, for God to pour out His Spirit beyond measure, God, in this nation. God, move in this nation. Move in this nation. Move in Castletown. Move in Douglas. Move in Peel. Move in Ramsey. Port Mary. Move, Lord Jesus Christ, in Laxey. And in every part, Lord Jesus, of this island, let the Spirit of God begin to move in the name of Jesus. In unprecedented ways. In uncontrollable ways. Let the Spirit of God begin to move. And God, help us to be ready to flow with you. Help us to be ready to move with you. As you move in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready, get ready. Amen. Alright. Now, if you don't want to be talking to your neighbor or your neighbor talking to you tonight, just tell him right now. Don't talk to me when he says, tell your neighbor. Because I am going to tell you to tell your neighbor something. If you don't want him to tell you anything, just tell him from now. Tell the other neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. I'm so glad to be on this island. Um, I dream about um, constantly saying to our church, I want to live in this little house on the prairie, out where to see greenery and just nature and everything. And uh, when I come to the island, I'm reminded of that, you know. But the Lord's not ready for me yet. <laughs> so I've got to stay in London. But I really love being here. I love the spirit. I love the atmosphere. I love what God is doing. Amen? Amen. Amen. To all of our friends and uh, family here that I've met since I've been here. I want to turn your attention to the book of John, chapter 11, and verse 14 and 15. I was toying with her to preach what I preach this morning, but I just sense the Holy Spirit um, this afternoon. Kind of, uh, so John, chapter 11, verse 14. And 15. Just a couple of words I want to preach from there in Jesus' name. John chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. It says, Then Jesus, in fact, let me read from this version. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go unto him. And let me turn back to my King James Version. It makes more sense if I'm going to say in my King James Version. <laughs> it says, verse 14, Lazarus is dead and I am glad. Lazarus is dead and I am glad. For your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Now, would you just look at your name and say, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> and I am glad. <laughs> That's my message. Lazarus is dead and I am glad. Jesus' favorite place to go in the Bible was Bethany. Um, and it's the place where he constantly went. And I, I think it's because of the way he was hosted when he went to Bethany. When he went to Bethany, he was hosted by his friends here, which would be Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And they would really look after Jesus. And when he would go there, he would definitely be visiting this home. And Mary and Martha, Martha would make sure she took care of Jesus. And Mary would just, just create an atmosphere. And I believe... You know, I say to our church, there are some favorite places that Jesus likes to be, to go to. You know, and we'll see that in the scriptures. There's some places that when he would go, he wouldn't get a great reception and could do very few miracles there, like Nazareth, 
And he went there. He could only do a few miracles. But there's some places that he went, like Bethany, he could do extraordinary things. He could do some miracles because of the way that he was hosted. By the way that he was received. You know, he even said to his disciples, when he sent them out, he said, when you go out, there are some places you're going to go that's not going to receive you too well. And when that happens to you, just dust the, the, just wipe the dust off your feet and then move on and go to another village and go to another place. In fact, he said, when, when um, you go to a home, if the Son of Peace be there, and then bless the home, and if the Son of Peace be there, and it's going to remain there. So it just, it just gives me a sense that there's some places where Jesus turns up, where he feels hosted and he's able to do mighty works in that place. He's able to do something now. I feel like there's some churches that God, that Jesus turns up to and he wants to do mighty works there, but he's not hosted there. Maybe they're busy doing what they normally do and They've not made no room for their new guests to do something special. Maybe even God will turn up in individuals' lives and wants to do a mighty work, but will he find faith? Will he find the room to do a miracle? And may God find an atmosphere, may he find the right kind of hosting, may he find the right kind of uh, atmosphere that he can do miracles in the midst of every living hope congregation on this island in Jesus name. We want him to show up and we want him to show up in power, we want him to show up in glory because we don't believe we're serving a different Jesus than the Jesus of the book. We believe he's the same yesterday, today and forever. How many believe that? And if he healed the sick yesterday, he can heal the sick today. He will deliver today. He's the same God. And he's here right now. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible says that Jesus had these friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And the Bible says that their brother Lazarus became sick. In verse 2 of chapter 11, the Bible says it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So it means that, it, it, it doesn't mean that because we worship that we're exempt from trouble. It doesn't mean that because we are praisers and, and we press in and we give God our very best that it exempts us from trouble sometimes visiting our homes, amen, yeah. or visiting our lives. Sometimes good, bad things happen to good people. Sometimes you go through some storms, amen, and it's not because there's sin in your life, but sometimes God is up to something. Yes. Amen. Amen. Because when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. Yes. Amen. 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 When you are down to nothing, God is up to nothing. So their brother Lazarus became, Lazarus became sick. And look at verse 3. It says, Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. Isn't it interesting the way that women frame questions? <laughs> that when women want something, the way they ask. Now my wife has a way now. My wife, to get to my home, you cannot get to my house without passing the Tesco's Express. It's impossible. You have to pass it. So my wife will call me and say, Pete, are you passing the Tesco's on the way home? <laughs> now, I can't get home with that passing the Tesco's. So I, now I've got to place. Just ask, what is it that you want from the Tesco's? Amen. A woman doesn't really say, I want a new dress. She says, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> I want new shoes. No, I have nothing to wear. And it's interesting the way that, that she has phrased this question to Jesus. Lord, she's appealing to his emotions. Lord, him who you love is sick. And then the Bible says that when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death 
but it's for the glory of God. That the Son of Man might be glorified thereby. Amen. Would it be great, amen, if we could just know that when we're going through something, it's for the glory of God. Yes. If every time God puts us through something, if he could just, you know, I remember back when I was growing up, and uh, if you're under a certain age, you might remember, but sometimes the TV used to have all these things, in, and it would say, this is just a test. Uh, this was just a test will come on the screen. So you know they're testing out something. Wouldn't it be great every time God puts you through something, if he said, this is just a test? Yeah. Huh? That would help. It would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. If you think about Job, when Job went through what Job went through, mm -hmm. it wouldn't it be great if God had just said to Job, before Job went through what he went through, this is just a test. Yeah. But Job had no idea about the conversation that went on in heaven. Yep. He had no idea that God had actually set him up. Yep. It was actually Satan wasn't thinking about Job until God brought Job's name up in the conversation. God said to Satan, where have you been? He said, I've been going to and fro the earth. Uh, where in the earth? He said, well, I've been Port St. Mary, I've seen Russo, and I've, I've, I've been over to uh, Ramsey, and I've seen Adrian and Maddie over there. And then God says, well, what, what about Rebecca and, uh, uh, and, and Kieran? Have you considered them? Now, why would God do that? I would have hated if God had brought my name up. If Satan wasn't thinking about me, but God brought his name up. Have you considered my servant Job? He's a good guy. He hates evil. He loves me. You know? And Satan's like, yeah, I did think about him, but I forgot him. Because, you know, you've got a hedge around him and, nah, if, it's, it's not even no point in going near him. God says, nah, that, but I tell you, if you move the hedge, Satan says, I promise you, this guy will curse you to your face. In other words, he was saying, and he is the accuser of the brethren, I mean, you know that. Watch how he accuses, he says, Satan, uh, Job is not serving you for naught. The only reason why Job is serving you is because of the way you bless him. But if you take away the hedge around him, just let me touch him for a while. I promise you, Satan will, uh, Job will curse you to your face. And God's like, nah, nah. But Job is not seeing this conversation. He's not privy to this conversation. He can't, he can't hear God bragging on him. He can't hear God's support and God's belief in him. You know, one thing we talk about, us having faith in God. Do you know that sometimes God has faith in you? Yes. Come on. He has faith in you. And he had faith in, in Job. And so Job went through all that Job went through. You know the story. Boils come on his skin. He lost his cattle. He lost his home. Everything started to be destroyed all around him. But Job kept on his integrity. He refused. Even when his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? He said, you speak like a foolish woman. And Job said, I came into this world naked. And naked I'm going to leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, I'll praise him in the storm. In other words, I'll raise a hallelujah in the midst of the storm. I'll raise a hallelujah in the midst of the mystery. Sing a little louder. In the, isn't that what we said? Sing a little louder in the midst of the mystery. In other words, when you don't understand, when you don't, when you can't work out what on earth is going on, that's the time when you can't trace God, then you must trust God. Yeah. Look at your name and say, when you can't trace him, trust him. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so Job, what if I, we know the end of the story. Now I always say to our church, Job is an interesting book, 42 chapters long. And actually what it seems like when you think 42 chapters, it seems like Job went through this thing for a long time. But it actually didn't go on for a long time. The reason why Job's, the book of Job is so long is because Job is asking a ton of questions. <laughs> and it's the questions of why. Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through it? And it's Job cursing the day he was born. And it's Job murmuring and complaining and moaning. And eventually when you read the book, it's almost like God said to Job, 
Gird up your loins like a man. Come on, pull up your trousers. Behave yourself. Wipe your face. And gird up your loins and like a man. And start to pray for your friends. And the Bible says as soon as Job prayed, God released his captivity. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Could it be that we're holding up our blessing? Could it be we're holding up the move of God to change situations? Because we're murmuring and we're complaining instead of singing and raising a hallelujah. Yeah. 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 Huh? Yeah. Are you raising a hallelujah? You know what I always say to our church? It's so easy to come and to sing the songs. Raise a hallelujah. This is how I fight my battles. It's easy to sing these songs. But when you face your challenge, that's the time to practice these songs. That's the time to live these songs. That's the time to apply these songs to our life. And I believe that when we're singing them in church, what we're actually doing is we're speaking faith to ourselves. And you are preparing yourself so when you go through what you go through, amen, you can live what you sing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, they said, him who you love sick, Jesus said, it's not unto death. Um, but it's just for God to be glorified through this. Now the Bible says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he stayed two days still in the same place. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, God does not always come straight away. Yeah. You know, I say, I always say, you know, when, if you want to understand what the invisible God is like, because none of us has ever seen him, but if we want to know what he is like, then we must read the Gospels and look at Jesus' life, because he is the visible image of the invisible God. Yeah. And he said, when you see me, you see the Father. So if you want to know what the Heavenly Father is like, then look at Jesus. Because he reveals the image of the invisible God. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And you, if you want to know, is God the Father, the almighty creator, is he interested in children, then look at Jesus. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Suffer the children to come unto me. If you want to know, does the heavenly Father, is he interested in people that are the broken, the outcast? Then we see actually that Jesus is more interested in the broken and in the outcast than those who are up and in. He's more in the down and out. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Amen. If you want to know, is he interested in women? Look at Jesus. Look what was surrounded by Jesus. If you want to know what God the Father is like, amen, will he heal the sick? Look at Jesus. Yeah. Amen. But we also see with Jesus that he doesn't always come straight away. He doesn't always come when we call him. Sometimes we pray and we wait. We pray and we wait. Amen? Yeah. And we wait. And this story is a classic story of two sisters that prayed for Jesus to come when they were in trouble. And Jesus stayed the same place and didn't move and didn't come. And I feel like this is an image of sometimes what happens to us in our lives. Amen? Amen. When Jesus eventually decided to go, he said to his disciples, well, let's go up to Bethany because our brother Lazarus is he's sleeping and I need to go and wake him up. Mm -hmm. Remember, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God. So when Jesus was going there, he, in his head, he's just sleeping. I'm going to wake him up. His disciples said, and they also come like us. They said, well, if he's sleeping, he's doing good. I need some sleep too. And Jesus like, Duh. we're not talking about natural sleep. He's like, Lazarus is dead. Amen? Amen. So verse 13, how be it Jesus spake not of his death, but they thought he had spoken that he, had he was taking a rest in sleep. Then Jesus said plainly to them, Lazarus is dead dead and I am glad that I wasn't there for the sake that you would believe. I believe that sometimes God allows certain things that will be mysteries and will puzzle us and he will cause sometimes Lazarus to die so that he can work a miracle in our life. Yes. Amen. I believe that God sometimes will allow things to happen to bring us to faith. 
Because sometimes when certain things are alive, we won't come to faith. Because these things are too alive. Amen. Now think about it. Um, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. The Bible says that Isaiah said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And I saw seraphims and cherubims, and they were flying around the throne, saying one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then he said, I saw myself, and I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And then an angel says, Lo, here's a coal, a live coal on the altar. And he touched my lips with it. And the Bible says, Then I heard a voice saying, Who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send me. Now, it's a short amount of verses, but think about it. Isaiah would never have heard the call for who will go for us until Uzziah died. It wasn't until Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord. It wasn't until Uzziah died that Isaiah saw himself. It wasn't until Uzziah died that he got the call for, to who will go for us. And then if that thing didn't happen, Isaiah would never have been at the place where he could say, here am I, Lord, send me. Sometimes things have to die to get us to the place of faith. Someone understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. Just today I, got, uh, I saw a message from um, uh, a lady named Mary, Mary Foley, who was a member of our church some time ago. And um, she's on Songs of Praise, this was on Songs of Praise this evening, sharing her story of forgiveness. Amen. Um, some years ago, back in 2005, um, I think June, uh, April 2005, her 15 year old daughter, Charlotte, was brutally stabbed to death by a 16-year-old girl. She was stabbed twice in her heart and died. And I remember getting that message that night and going to the hospital and just broken with Mary. And then that Sunday morning we come to church and our church is just overwhelmingly filled with all young people, at least 100 plus young people, all broken and crying and mourning and etc. And we, instead of even Mary, whose daughter had just died, having the space and the capacity to mourn herself, are having to reach out to these broken young people who are just weeping and crying. And, and then next week they came, brought more young people. And, and in, in, instead of us having the space and capacity to actually mourn ourselves, we're having to comfort and minister to these young people. Amen. And as we all minister to them and, and blessing them and helping them through their difficult while trying to hold ourselves together. Amen. God brought a miracle in the midst of that. In the midst of that, we saw most, a lot of those young people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. We saw them born again and filled with the Spirit. We saw them baptized in water. And today, some of them are leaders in some of our congregation. And we saw an awesome move of God's Spirit. <clears throat> now, um, the girl that killed Charlotte, her name was Beatrice. She got caught. She was put in prison. And I just felt from the Holy Spirit that I should write to this girl. So I wrote her a letter and she wrote back to me. And so I kept writing to her. And I said to her, I really felt, I really feel like, um, I really feel like you need to say what you're saying to me. Because she was talking about her brokenness and, and how sorry she was. Because it wasn't Charlotte she wanted to hurt, it was someone else. So I felt the Holy Spirit say, put her in touch with Mary. And so, uh, I put her in touch with Mary and they began to write to each other and Mary was able to go to the prison and confront her own child's killer. Amen. And, and was able through that now to, to, to forgive this girl. But what I've done, it, it released Mary as well. Amen. Because she was able, now imagine she would have lived with this bitterness. Amen. Of this girl that took her, her daughter's life and they began to communicate and God done a mighty healing right there. Amen. Now, let me tell you, I wish, I wish Charlotte was here. 
I wish she was here today. I wish I could see her. She'd probably be 29 years old now. Amen. And I wonder sometimes what she would be doing. Amen. But let me tell you how God can bring life out of death. How God can bring a beautiful flower. Amen. How a, a seed can fall into the ground and die. And it brings forth great fruit. God wrought a mighty work. Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. Now, listen, I, I think I shared this morning um, when um, I was 18 years old, I went to a party. And when I was at this party, these guys from Hackney, they bounced me. And I turned around to confront them. And somebody said to me, Peter, leave it. Peter, leave it. And I remember at the time there was a flash of a conversation I had when I was in prison about that whole scripture about turning the other cheek, you know, someone hits you. And it just came to my mind real quick that I had this conversation with the prison chaplain and he was telling me the scripture and I was saying to him, there is no way someone is going to punch me and I'm going to let him hit me again. <laughs> and we, I argued with him that afternoon that there is no way, I don't even care if Jesus said it. I remember telling him, it ain't going to happen. But I remember his explanation to me about non-confrontation, about refusing to be violent back to, amen, someone that's being violent towards you. And at that situation, I remember walking away because that thing flashed in my mind. Five minutes later, these same guys bounced my best friend, Michael. Michael was born the 19th of September, 1967. I'm born the 18th of September, 1967. He was born a day after me. We were like that, we were tight. They bounced Michael and Michael, responded and the fight broke out and these guys stabbed my friend Michael in his heart, amen, and he died that night in my arms. 18 years old, first time I've watched someone physically die, amen, and it was through that experience of uh, Michael's death that I met a lady named Doris and Doris invited me to a church on the Sunday and I went to a church on the Sunday and God gloriously preached the gospel to me. Amen. And I remember walking down the aisle the following Sunday and giving my heart to Jesus. Amen. And my life turning around by the glory and the praise of Almighty God. And I'm telling you, like I said, I wish, I wish Mike was here today. I don't understand the mystery of it all. Amen. But I, one thing I do know. That when that seed fell into the ground and died, it brought forth fruit. Amen. God brought glory out of something that could be so devastating. God brought some miracle out of that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there to the intent that you may believe. And I believe what God is, Jesus is saying here is, if I had come and prayed for Lazarus when he was sick, your faith wouldn't have moved. Because I believe, you believe that I can heal. But I want to do something else with your faith. So I want to raise Lazarus from the dead because I want to shift your faith. Yeah. You see, see, we've had some trials and we keep... We're at the same level of trials, and, and God wants to stretch our faith. Yes. He wants to take your faith to another level yes. and to another place. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. It won't feel so hallelujah when you go through it. <laughs> but he wants to take our faith to another level. And sometimes, amen, God will wait for something that's sick to die. Yeah. Do you know he waited four days? He waited after they had buried Lazarus. They, he waited till they had put Lazarus in the tomb. And he waited until after their belief, the Jews had a, 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 like a, um, a belief system that said that when someone dies, after three days, the spirit of that person is still hovering around that person. But they believed on the fourth day that the spirit was gone, that that was it, it was over. 
So Jesus said, you know what? I'm not even going to come when they feel like the spirit is still hovering over. I am going to wait until after, when they have given up all hope. I'm going to come when they think it's over. They said, Jesus said, roll the stone away. He said, he stinks by now. In other words, decomposition has set in. His body has begun to rot. Amen. And we don't believe it's possible. Amen. But God is saying, I am the God of the impossible. I will raise anything dead from the grave. And I will bring it back to life. I will bring it back to life. And I don't, know, I don't know what situation is in your life or what you might be. And I felt as I was preparing this this afternoon. Amen. What prophetically might happen in your life. But let me tell you, it's not unto death, but it's for the glory of God. Amen. I said it's for the glory of God. Amen. God's going to get glory out of it. I said he will get glory out of it. No matter how deep the pain is, he will get glory out of it. Man. I think the worst thing I've ever faced in my life, sorry to be talking about death so much, is the death of my mother back in 2013. That's the worst thing I've faced in my life. And I've faced a lot of things, but that was like the hardest thing. And although, like I said, I goodness, I wish I could do anything to bring back my mum. But the Lord did something to my faith and did something to my life as a result of my mum's passing. God took my faith and my love and my appreciation and my faith in him to another level. I saw God in a dimension that I didn't know him before I went through that situation of my mom dying. I, I saw God in his shepherd role even clearer than I knew him before. Amen. Amen. I saw God as a comforter even more than I knew him before. Amen. Now. God will allow certain things to happen to bring us to faith in him. Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. Now, it's almost like Jesus is saying, God is saying, My son, in whom I love, Jesus, the son of God, is dead, and I'm glad for your sake, to the intent that you may believe. Because, listen, God took the most painful thing. It took the most painful thing. It took the crucifixion of the Son of God. It took the death of God's only Son. It took God agony and pain of the death of His Son to bring glory out of that and bring life out of that. Amen. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. The crucifixion of Jesus actually, probably, the worst thing that could happen to the Father, the death of His Son. But God says, this death is, this, this is not unto death, but it's for my glory. Because out of that, many sons are going to come to glory. Out of that, many sons are going to come to glory. And you can look through the scriptures, God, and you can see it's actually when things start to die in our life that God brings life. Yes. Can't you see it? Do you know even with Abraham, when God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 11 and told him to leave his country, leave his kindred and he's going to give him a great and precious promise do you know Abraham took his father Tira with him and he's dwelt in a certain place for quite a few number of years but it took for the death of Terah his dad to die before we get to Genesis 12 where God now comes back to Abraham and promises him in other words it took Terah to die before he got the fullness of the promise up until that time God just said to him leave your kindred but when Terah died, now he heard, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your kindred like the sands of the seashore. I'm going to make your name great, Abraham. I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham. Amen. Some things have to die before, amen, our faith can be at a certain level. Yeah. Amen? amen? Lazarus is dead. And I am glad. You know, our, as I was preparing, God reminded me of... We had this building, it was uh, um, just, was, we were converted a certain place into a church and the fire marshals had come and said, you have to close there because there's not enough fire escapes, etc. And they gave us 20 days to move out, to pack up, and our church was like, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? What's going to happen? And I felt in the midst of that, when people say, no, we need to go and get school, I'm like, I don't think that's 
that's what God is saying. Amen. I just heard God say, this thing I'm going to use to test, test you and to test your faith and to bring your faith to another level. This went on for weeks, looking for, I'm finding out, trying to check out what we're going to do, God. How are we going to move, God? What are you going to do, God? And then when it came to about the third day before we were supposed to move out, the people that were at the front of the building, a big, massive glass building, something, uh, I think it was when Enron went bust, that company shut down, and then all of a sudden there was this big building next to where we was that just opened up. And two days before, the guy, the landlord came and said, would you like to take over the front? I said, of course we will. <laughs> but let me tell you, leading up to that, it was like, what's happening? What's going on? What's, why is this happening? And it's almost like God saying, I let that thing die. And I'm glad I did it. To the intent that you might believe. Yeah. To the intent that you might have faith. Because I want to bring your faith to another level. Hallelujah. Yeah. And sometimes some things happen. And we can't understand why they have happened. And God uses situations to bring our faith to another level level. And I know really in this building today, there's probably lots of stories that just attest to this fact that God is sometimes in your most broken state. It's sometimes when you've gone through the hardest thing that God shows up in a mighty way, right? <coughs> that God shows himself glorious. The scary thing about it is, the scary thing is, what does God need to do to get your faith? To believe. Because I tell you, I was um, sitting in a room, I think I would have been about 15, nearly 16, maybe 15, with my friends. And we was in my friend Astafan's room, and I remember we was all there smoking marijuana and talking nonsense like you do when you're on marijuana. And we were talking about spirits and ghosts and aliens and whether we believed in aliens, and whether we believed in ghosts and spirits, and whether we believed in angels, and whether we believed in God and Jesus. And there was me, I don't know what possessed me that night, um, and when they were talking about do we believe in God, I was sat in that room and I said, I don't believe in God. And all my friends, even though they were all like spaced out after smoking, they were like, Pete, you can't say that, man. You can't say that. Of course there's a God. <laughs> And they were arguing with me that I can't say that. Like, I'm like, I don't believe in God. I said, I believe that Jesus may have been an historical man, but I've never seen no God. And I feel like God heard that conversation that night. I feel like, okay. You don't believe in me. Now, I, I kid you not, the following week, the following week, my friend's mum, comes to me and she said she went to church the night, this was on the Monday, she said she went to church and her pastor gave her a message to give to me. That if I don't change my ways, certain things are going to start to happen in my life. And when she said it, I was a young guy, her cocky, things were going on, it went there, came out the other room. That same afternoon we went out, I got arrested and I got put in prison. Now normally when I get arrested, I'll go court the next day and I'll come out and, like, and then I'll just go back. This time, no parole. Now I never saw freedom again for the next 20 months of my life. But watch this. God, I feel like God heard that conversation that night and said, all right, I'm going to break you in pieces. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your freedom. I'm going to let some things die in your life. And you will believe in me. And it was a, it's a hard ride. It got so hard. I was sharing with my church the other day. And some of them said, when you were sharing, oh man, I was feeling your pain. But uh, a friend of mine was in the prison. Uh, his name was Tony. And he, he went out. He got let out. But he came back up to visit me. And he, he brought me some um, black ash, like marijuana. Does everyone understand what I'm talking about? Like, like, you're also proper, you know? <laughs> and so I, I, I put it in my mouth to get it into prison. And, and as I was going through, the prison officer says, open your mouth. And I thought, oh no. 
If I open my mouth, he's gonna find this and there's gonna be extra time after that. The only thing I can do is big like this, I've got to swallow this thing. And so I decided I'm gonna swallow. This thing cut my throat up. It blood was coming out and he's like, oh fuck it, come on, bring it up in there. I was like, no way, and I managed to get it down. Cut all my throat getting out and I got in the cell by it. I was fed up with a friend named Lee. I said, Lee, I've just swallowed this thing. Now, all Lee was interested in is this thing was his own. He didn't care about me bleeding or anything. And Lee's like, drink some fairy liquid. So he's giving me fairy liquid to drink. Bubbles are coming out. If I come out, come out. Like, nothing's coming back up. Sorry to be graphic. Going to the toilet, searching through, you know, the pieces. Nothing's in there, you know. But what happened? Because I think I drank so much fairy liquid, the thing came out the cellophane. It was wrapped up inside and it dissolved inside of me. So for three days of my life, they took me and they put me on the hospital wing. I was completely zombie-like out of it. Like, because God was dealing with me and I wouldn't let go of this thing. So I think, God, I'm going to break you, sir. And I remember three days in the hospital wing, coming towards the end. It's like a light shone in the, in the cell of the, the prison hospital where I was. And I felt a presence come into that place. And I began to cry. Now, I was not hallucinating. This was a real experience. I felt God come in a room and I was like, God, please forgive me. I give my life to you. I promise you I'll never smoke again. And I'm banging on the cell door. I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. I want to give my life to Jesus. And they're, they're probably thinking he's hallucinating. I was having a God experience. God experience. And God used that situation to break me down. And break me down. And break me down to the point. Amen. I mean, like I said, shared it with Michael. Michael was like the final thing that God did to break me down and break me down. And took things until finally I surrendered in Jesus' name. So I asked, and I've seen this. I've seen it happen so many times. People say, why is it that when people that give their life to God when they've gone through the worst thing? Because sometimes God just has to take some stuff to get us to believe. He has to do some things to bring us to a point of faith that He's alive, that He's glorious, that He's awesome, that He's powerful, and that He's mighty, that He loves us. And like He said, to, to Mary and Martha, amen, I, I, I am the resurrection and the life. And like he said to Job, you know, though I took, though I slay me, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though I've taken these things from you, Job, I'll give you double. Amen. I'll give you seven times more than what I took from you. Hallelujah. And that's what God will do. He will break us down until he gets our faith to another level and to another place of faith. That we trust him. That we rely on him. That we depend on him. Is someone hearing me here today? Amen. So as I close, I really, really believe that what God is saying to you, when you go through some storms, and when you go through, when you are like Joseph and you find yourself in the pit, and when you are like Joseph and you find yourself in prison, and when you are like Joseph and you find yourself in Potiphar's house, God is saying, I'm using these things to get you to the palace. I'm going to stretch your faith, Joseph. I'm going to get you to trust me more. And Joseph, I'm sure, didn't understand when he was going through what he was going through. But towards the end, he said to his brothers, listen, I couldn't understand why you guys sold me out. I don't understand why you did this to me, but I get it now. God meant it for my good. You meant it for harm. God meant it for good. God will break us down to get us to believe to get us to trust, to get us to rely upon Him and depend upon Him, to stretch our faith, to get us to the place of belief. Can I say to you guys that some of these stories that I've shared with you, though they are horrific, Michael's death, Charlotte's death, but great transitions happened through those different seasons. When Michael died, transitioned me into faith and trust and giving my life to God. When Charlotte 
died. I almost, I got to that place where I was so broken that I said, God, I can't do this with pastoring anymore. I feel like I want to just go and just work with you. For God says no. He says, you pastor, but you make this church so youth friendly. And I will make youth get saved and born again right here. And truly, if you look in our congregation, probably 70% are young people. Youth, we're able to reach youth and get them to come to Jesus. Massive transition, painful moments. But God says, I'm glad. I'm glad you went through what you went through. Because in the intent that you would believe.